Welcome. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today, this afternoon, or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from. It's a pleasure to present today's program, Reframing the Past with Megan O'Brien and Elena Phipps, as part of our Curator's Choice series, which offers the chance to join curators for lively conversations about their passions and projects that inspire audiences to engage with different worldviews and find joy in the diversity of human experience. Today, we are hosting a conversation between Megan O'Brien and textile scholar Elena Phipps about new ways of looking at indigenous knowledge and creative practice in the realm of textile making. Megan O'Brien is a Haida and Kwakwa Kiwak artist whose Chilkat textiles are based on the knowledge and artistic practices of her ancestors. Her projects engage specialized techniques of basketry and weaving and use mountain goat wool, cedar bark, and other earthly materials to connect to the rhythms and patterns of the natural world. Megan is a Northwest Coast weaver from the community of Albert Bay, British Columbia. Her innovative approach to, text to traditional art forms of basketry and yelfku or raven's tail and nahin or chilkat textile weaving creates a continuity between herself and her ancestors. Megan now lives in Vancouver and is currently exploring the intersection of indigenous materials and techniques with the world of fashion and 3D printing. Elena Fitz, focuses on the history of textile materials and techniques in cultural contexts. She was a textile conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for 34 years and co-curated award-winning textile exhibitions like the Colonial Andes, Tapestries and Silverwork from 1430 to 1830 in 2004, and the Interwoven Globe, Worldwide, Text Worldwide Textile Trade in 2013. In 2013, she also curated the Four Selvage Peruvian Cloth, Ancient Threads, New Directions for the Fowler Museum. Elena's most recent publication is Woven Brilliance, published by the Textile Museum Journal this year. She has served as president of the Textile Society of America from 2011 to 2014 and teaches in UCLA's Department of World Arts and Culture since 2011. Before we get going, a few quick pieces of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and then select side by side mode, which will make sure that the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions you would most like to be considered answered at the end of the program. Okay, that's enough from me. Over to you, Megan. Hi, just gonna pull up our screen. That looks great. Awesome, glad it worked. <laughs> so thank you so much for the introduction, Bianca, and thank you, Elena and uh, the Fowler Museum for inviting me to participate in this conversation and uh, share a little bit about uh, who I am, where I come from, and what I've been doing. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, all right, um, I guess I, as a preface, I, I'm living in Vancouver, which is Coast Salish territory. So just want to acknowledge the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam uh, First Nations, whose traditional territory it is, um, with the southernmost group of uh, the Northwest Coast considered, I guess, maybe a little bit down to Washington. But uh, so this first slide I have here is, um, I'm gonna spend uh, maybe about five minutes just kind of grounding um, my talk and uh, like, acknowledging um, the communities that I come from and uh, the names that I've been given that are very much tied to culture. So I was born and raised for the first 10 years of my life in the Kwakwaka'wakw community of Alert Bay. And this image was taken by Mason Michon. It's the interior of the community big house um, in Alert Bay. And that was built in the 1960s um, by people whose the intention of it was to, um, after the potlatch ban was lifted to um, create a space that all nations from the Kwakwaka'wakw, all the different tribes could have a place to celebrate um, because this was a bit of a transformation of what the big house was. Um, and the music that you heard, I just want to note, it's from a CD that was created by the community um, in the 90s. It was created as a fundraiser to rebuild the big house. So this is the rebuilt one and it was um, because it was burned down by an arsonist. So, um, I mean, immediately people raised money and I think within a couple of years it was rebuilt. It's very um, inspiring and if you'd 
more interested in that aspect, um, it's available for sale as well. And so just uh, the three names that are on here are uh, Jad Kajus, which comes from the Haida side of my family, um, my great grandmother and all of my lineage comes from my mother. Um, and John Kajus was the name that my great grandmother was given as a girl before she left the islands. And uh, the second name on there is Kohilaga, means smoke that comes out of the top of the big house, welcoming people to Feast of Palach. And uh, that's held, that's a very old name in our family that's held in our treasure chest. And then Megan O'Brien is my English name and legal name, I guess. Um, and comes mostly, I guess, from my father um, because he immigrated from Ireland. Um, and yeah, I just want to acknowledge like um, the strength like of the culture that exists and that I had the privilege of, of um, coming into as somebody interested in my uh, kind of late 20s and was about 27 when I became interested in learning and this desire to learn was born. So I've just got a few pictures this, uh, about why I wanted to learn to weave was largely based on um, more of an interest in ethnobotany, I guess, um, the relationship between people and plants. I had a really long standing um, connection through commercial fishing on the Northwest Coast um, to landscapes that have been left primarily intact. Um, you know, there's been almost no logging. So, a period of about five or six years of just harvesting food and out of that, a desire to weave a basket to kind of connect connect the plants that I really, really loved so much and to honor them by carrying them in, in baskets that um, were meant to be used. And I feel that this thread of um, the foundation of function and on the land with the traditional practice really, really grounds me. Um, the more that I follow my journey um, kind of as an artist and, and kind of entering through the teachers, um, you know, I finished my very first basket and my teacher, Carrie Dick, uh, she took me to Vancouver to the art galleries and said, you're selling this <laughs> and the art is meant to go away from you. You're not meant to keep it. And that was a really good lesson early on about letting go of the work and acknowledging that even though we make it, it doesn't belong to us, even though the knowledge is with us. The knowledge also isn't belonging to an individual. It is meant to be shared and it's meant to continue through time. So uh, this is just an, an image of me in um, a berry patch. Um, and yeah, it's the very first baskets that I wove were of uh, red cedar and I used them. They were pretty uh, haggard, I guess, but um, I didn't have a teacher at the time. So like I mentioned, my first teachers were Carrie Dick and Donna Cramner. Um, so I've got a few images of of the process and a few of the finished uh, pieces. So there was a saying um, by my grandfather, who is like a inventor and uh, welder and mechanic, really brilliant man. He only had a grade five education, but he was just like a genius with the things that he made. He was a boat builder as well. But he said, if you want to understand how something works, um, you take it apart and you put it back together, you know, and you'll get a really good understanding. and I kind of think about that sometimes um, when I'm working um, about what it means when you're, you know, harvesting from a, a cedar tree, something that is growing for centuries, if not sometimes millennia. We don't harvest from trees that that large. It's usually trees that are, you know, one to two feet and around. You harvest from the side that is um, when the sun's going down. I guess so it doesn't burn the bark because you are damaging the tree by taking the bark and so we always thank and acknowledge the tree um, and ask permission um, kind of on an energetic level when we're harvesting. Um, so this is uh, yeah taking taking apart a tree is really quite an amazing thing <laughs> and uh, there's a linearity to the way that the bark grows. If you select a tree that's good it's got really straight bark grown vertically and there are layers of the the work that is what I'm doing in this image is splitting apart the layers to be woven. Um, so I quickly got introduced to um, very, very fine weaving from Carrie. And for me, there was like a bit of like a, an obsessiveness with it. And I've really enjoyed the space that it provides for me um, because really what it offered me, what I think I was looking for throughout my time on the land and harvesting was this kind of like exit out of human thinking um, 
And this piece is called Growth Rings of Cedar. Uh, it was, I wove this one over the course of about two years off and on. Um, and I, I think that's where a lot of those like concepts of time and the dissolution of time and the relationship between weaving and time comes from, for me is really a direct experience with the way that it feels when I'm working. And this piece, um, you know, with the origin point where you always mark your beginning strand that you're weaving around. And this one, it's like the amount of time that increased exponentially longer and longer, the bigger the piece got to make it grow just the tiniest bit. Um, so this one was titled Growth Rings of Cedar and it really started to feel like on a not quite the same scale, obviously, but just what it feels like to take so long to grow. Um, and it was a really beautiful uh, experience to connect with that. So this is an image of the bottom of a basket. This is the same basket on the side. Um, so even though my practice was really firmly rooted in, in a sense of function and utilitarian nature, um, through all of the things that this uh, work has shown me um, and led me to understand, I kind of see them, I look at them a bit differently now and I see them um, as a form of meditation for myself. It's a really deeply personal process for me that uh, offers me a lot. And I was really fascinated when I encountered the work of Agnes Martin and some of her ideas of the grid. Um, and there's a quote from her that says, she was meditating on trees as innocence um, when, when she was given the vision of like this grid as a painting. And I just think that connection between the grid and trees and weaving um, is kind of overlooked as like being a grid, I guess. It's very grid-like in nature. And the sensation that I feel with it is like really maybe related in some ways um, because it's that like fundamental nature of what they say the construction of reality is in terms of like um, space and time being woven in the theory of relativity, which is quite fascinating. I guess it's actually measurable. Um, and this is a piece called Genetic Identity. Uh, and a couple more photos. Um, this was a collaboration with my cousin Jay Simeon. And it's uh, our Haida families crest is one of them is a sculpin so it's images of that so i've been a bit of a brief an abbreviated little section on a bit more of traditional um forms of weaving this is uh, raven's tail cheeks robe um the patterns on it here are the top border is the spirit of the shadow of the tree reflected in water and the side panels are called the Uligan dip net and the central design field is um, one within another. It's meant to represent bent wood boxes stacked inside of each other um, as a form of wealth. And for me, this was a piece I, I consider being, um, you know, responsibility as an artist to give into the re rebuilding of our culture and communities. The first major um, work that I made under the guidance of William White, um, he really encouraged me to dress our people and make sure it was important to me to make sure that there was a work being used how it was originally intended to be used. So this was given from our clan to Chief Skill Helans um, from the village of Yan on Haida Gwaii. This is an image of a piece called Sky Blanket. Um, I worked with also with my cousin Jay Simeon and Andy Everson on the design and uh, as well, my mom contributed. Her idea was the, the black and white tonal in the middle face and the Grenier family also um, early on was uh, contributing with, as well with ideas. Um, but this piece was based on the work that I did with Mountain Goat Wool. And through that, like this was one of the really big things around time that um, really, really like really impacted me, I guess, because it was a sense of um, the dissolution of linear time through uh, like an experience of like your consciousness or your mind. And um, so it's meant to represent a worldview rather than a family crest. And it's the three faces represent the past, present and future um, or our ancestors, us alive today and our descendants. And the connection between the eyes visually is meant to be referencing how physical objects um, can be carried through many, many generations and even in the role of museums, how they've preserved our culture. Um, we have this opportunity to have a level of communication with generations that either we've made things that get carried in a museum or a family collection, like 
where it's a method of communication, I guess. And there's one quote that I really wanted to share. It's uh, by uh, Loretta Todd, uh, her essay about the future. And I really, really love this because I think this concept of time is really overlooked with uh, when we're talking about uh, work today and our concepts of the past and future and kind of evolutionary thinking, I guess, is very Western scientific. So the quote is, how do we talk about the future of Aboriginal art without talking about our concepts of time? And for that matter, how do we talk about Aboriginal art without talking about where and when our art and artists are located within the spectrum and concepts of time? Have we so internalized the colonizers' thought processes that we now proudly proclaim, proclaim their ideologies for them? Uh, this is a piece, um, an example of Chilkat weaving. And it was woven uh, as a replica for, this is a, a recreation of the original robe by Andy Everson which shows where the pieces came from. So this piece was cut in ceremony and gifted, and then again, cut up and uh, made into an apron. And then I took that design as an apron um, and wove it, which is something very uh, much like our people would never really do that because the important parts of it would be missing, which is the act of cutting it ceremonially and publicly and the gifting of it. So these would be very recognizable pieces um, in community. Uh, this piece, for me, it's a bit of a, shows the process. Uh, it was a bit of a mind puzzle to figure out and I felt like it kind of contained the same kind of like impossibleness of trying to think about where, what the solution is for indigenous people moving forward in the world that we live in today where it's very complicated. Um, anyway, part of uh, my pathway, I guess, um, was just an opportunity to work or to present work in a fashion context. So. I, I met uh, Sage Paul in 2017 at Western Canada Fashion Week. The OCC1 Contemporary Arts Collective had got funding to bring three artist designers to present. And I wasn't really, I was making like a little bit of pieces, but I wasn't specifically aiming in that direction. But I did see some connections um, with that. Uh, with that world, I guess, in terms of tradition, in terms of respect for the past, respect for techniques and process um, and the handmade. So this is a medicine bag. And uh, usually like those are already woven in our culture. Um, and this is an image of some of the pieces I've started to expand upon um, it with uh, how the pieces are warped on the loom. And just to mention that I kind of see a parallel between these with the already established art forms of engraving, jewelry, and adornment that are sold outside of culture. So I've got a number of images with the, the fashion context that I'm going to kind of go scroll through and kind of just speak over um, all these different ways of warping the loom are kind of a new thing that I don't think has been done before. It's usually hanging like by one single strand over the top. So I'm warping the loom in a complete circle. Um, and in other ways like this. So it's put on the loom in that way. Um, and I've just been excited about miniaturizing uh, and kind of trying to, I guess, bridge interests personally, but also trying to figure out ways to bring the work forward where it can be honored both within our culture and outside of our culture, because a lot of the times the way that work is functioning, we're making traditional regalia and we're selling it as art that hangs on walls, which is one of the ways our work exists, but I would like to see it. Um, all of our aspects of culture, you know, our culture is very much kind of, you know, our potlatches instead of being months long, like they used to be, they'll be on the weekend um, to kind of fit in the margins of capitalist life. So I guess um, in a way it's kind of a, yeah, these are like, I saw fashion. I, the only thing I really actually made with the clothing, it's, well, the accessories, but the white dress on the left, the, I made that one entirely and saw the clothing that I made more as sketches and kind of as a contrast to um, the strictness of the weaving style that I've worked in. This is an image of my grandma Minnie um, wearing it. I like that these necklaces and pendants can be used, um, I think in a respectful way by people outside of our culture and who have 
provided a lot of support um, for our artists. There's been some really amazing examples of artists who have been successful commercially, but have used a lot, a lot of the money that they've made to um, potlatch a lot of the carvers that are chiefs. That's really something that happens. And um, yes, yeah, my grandma Minnie, and I love this picture of her. Uh, she's just like an awesome woman and uh, carries herself really well. So this little other, the other way that I've kind of like explored kind of out of necessity, I guess, was um, yeah, this idea of technology and repatriation and working with uh, SFE's Making Culture Lab. So we, we set about because the work Sky Like It had been um, in circulating in anthropology and contemporary contexts and museums um, for about six or seven years, I believe. Um, so it was quite a long time. And then there was one of the shows was gonna have a tour across Canada and um, kind of get through this part uh, is we ended up digitally recreating the work um, so that the original robe could return to my family for use in um, a Hithigwila ceremony. So I'll have some photos of that after, but this is it on display at the Art Gallery of Alberta. The show is called Border X. Um, so the animated projection of this work starts with like the Pleiades constellation. Um, and then it's got the mountain goat wool, um, mountain goat wool spinning that I did back in 2011 on the sides. So there's a cloud point pass, a wireframe pass, a beauty pass and a natural pass. This is the wireframe. So it's kind of about, it's about a five minute long video, I think. And um, it kind of cycles between these stages um, of the blanket. And I like that uh, for a viewer in a museum, it gives, it raises the question of like, why, why does this piece exist? Which to me is a really important question and foundation. And the reason that work exists digitally um, was to replace the original robe and my grandma, she's like 83 now, and um, she's such, I kind of wove it with her in mind. So um, we, yeah, this was, I mean, we haven't, I'm really grateful for families who've held our culture intact and continue potlatching all through the potlatch ban that happened on the Northwest Coast, um, because it gives us something to go back to and learn from. And there's a tremendous generosity um, amongst people and supporting people and to returning to our ceremonies. So our family has a period, we had a period of, I think about 90 years where there was inactivity. Um, and 2011 was uh, the first time that we, we had a feast. So it was feasting and potlatching and uh, we named our whole family. That's where the name Kohiliga came, came from, uh, was from that. We had about 75 family members that came and uh, yeah, this other ceremony, this is uh, Kista Rose Davidson. She's my sister Avis's daughter. She's the first uh, great grandchild in the family. And um, yeah, this was a Hithikwila ceremony and it's a baby naming ceremony for 10 months. And yeah, I feel like good about this work, brought it home to see it be danced. Um, and yeah, it was really nice to have it in that space and um, for that occasion. So that is all I got for you. And looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Megan. It's, uh, it's so wonderful to see your work and process. And of course, this is a short program. It would be, um, we could watch the hour, the time, we could watch you manifest time in, uh, by watching you spinning your yarns or, or weaving your, um, twining your blankets. It's, it's a meditative process that um, most people would never have access to. Um, and you remind us about this uh, intersection of time and space in the creating of, of objects. And I have to say that when I first met you and saw your, saw your exhibition, 
I was so drawn to your small um, baskets. You know, you showed them in the beginning of your talk, and I think people don't realize the the size, the scale of them is so small, and yet, you know, they have such grace and beauty, but they also have an incredibly power. They have a powerful presence, even though it's such a small object. Um, one knowing how incredibly complex it is to to weave with those hundreds of of strands of, of cedar bark but also just the patience and the time and the concentration that it takes to create them do you do you feel like you can continue that that level of focus in your work now or do you are you shifting into new directions uh, I feel like the basketry in particular is, um, yeah, like I mentioned, like really personal. I feel like it's almost like a place that I can go to, like a refuge um, in a way, because I found the world extremely challenging to live in in my younger years and found being a person um, and intellect, intellect and thinking, overthinking, um, really like a curse. And I really found like a space the space inside of myself that I see in the natural world and I think we all have that like in our like root in our core like in our stomach area is like you think about the um, I guess yoga and Chinese medicine and things like that what they say is like in that area of your body that connecting into that area through breath um, and yeah I think there's some ties to meditative cultures and techniques that doing the work brings you into so I'm interested in that and I'm excited um, in my next steps to work on some, uh, like I'd like to do a traditional chill cat blanket um, mm -hmm. as a series in this like series of things based on the apron. Mm -hmm. And then maybe just work in more of a normal scale because the fine stuff have gone really, 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 really fine and detailed. And there's part of me that enjoys that, but to kind of like open it up and mm -hmm. make works that don't take quite as long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you wanted to, um, the title of this program is Reframing the Past, which was part of a phrase that you mentioned when we started talking about doing this. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that means to you and what you, what, what you see in terms of understanding what's gone before, before and, and how how we can engage in the future with the kind of values and systems um, that have meaning um, that you embody with your work as well. Yeah, um, I think it was like reframing the past and envisioning the future. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, I guess, an idea out there. I've heard some people talk about it that um, traditional art forms, you know, Kind of only existing for for the commercial art market some people depending on our own individual histories as indigenous people we all like all the communities and areas have a different history and relationship to our own culture and sometimes there's communities that have lost so much that you can only access things in remnants through books if you were you know kind of lucky enough to be recorded by an anthropologist you know mm -hmm. so there's some i think sometimes there's resentment towards that because of the lens things are given given or um, the lens that the work is seen through is seen through like a uh, European person or something, how they're translating our culture and then therefore how we then absorb our, our culture if we don't have a strong um, oral history. Um, so that relationship is a bit funny, but I know in the Alert Bay, Bay Area, um, like Franz Boas, the anthropologist lived there and he, he spent a lot of time with the community. And um, I know a lot of researchers use those texts as ways to bring back ceremonies. Like the Hithaguila ceremony was brought back, I think, mm -hmm. by a small group of guys. And I think Mike Willie was one of them. And mm -hmm. um, with enough of a foundation with what's been preserved orally and person to person in different families um, and the text, you can really put together something really powerful. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just basically, I guess, trying to, uh, I guess, big conversation and question, but generally want to, you know, expand on what doing a traditional art form has given me because it gives so much more um, understanding. I kind of look at it sometimes as that was our form of an education mm -hmm. because the making of 
an object um, has lessons embedded in it and teachings embedded in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've been working with textiles and studying them and analyzing them and, and mostly in museum contexts for the past 40 years. The first time I think I ever made the connection between um, textiles from a museum point of view and textiles from a community point of view really was um, going to a Margaret Mead film festival at the Natural History Museum in New York and they um, they showed uh, some of Boaz's um, films from the turn of the you know turn of the 20th century early I think 1910 or something and and they were dances probably from exactly from Allard Bay and they were seeing these uh, robes being danced and the fringes in motion it was an amazing transformation of something that I always saw as a very kind of dead thing to something that was very much alive and I wonder if there's a way to share more of the idea of clothing and, and garments as movement as part of a process you know even in a museum context um, could be uh, something that might um, engage in uh, new ways of thinking about the materials and, um, uh, and new appreciation for both how they would be used traditionally, but also maybe in a new context of um, of people searching for meaning now in life and in art through art. Yeah, yeah, I like to see the. I mean, two things, I guess. Um, my teacher Willie White, he. Um, he shared an idea for an exhibit he had. He always wanted to do this Chilcot weaving show where you walked in at the opening and all the walls were empty. And uh, and then all our people came in like dancing uh -huh. them, and then they uh -huh. were installed. Uh -huh. <laughs> but just to like really <laughs> emphasize that he's, <laughs> he's a real, uh, he's an awesome, awesome person. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so that yeah. was pretty yeah. cool because, and then you'd kind of be limited with that because uh, you'd have to be at the opening to really get it and see. But uh, yeah, that's it is definitely. I mean, this the work I think has, especially the Chilkat or Nahin weaving, has so much spirit. And um, I don't know where that comes from with the work or what it's connected to, but it's really, really, yeah, really quite strong. And I think there's like this kind of through the making of the necklace style pieces, partly because it's so labor intensive and time consuming to weave full size pieces. And in a, like, you know, I could probably spend like three or four years if I wanted to weave like a really fine, like garment, you know, like in a Western style, like I thought of a beautiful, like um, dress with like a uh, kind of like a bell shape, cupcake shape, but like the Bentwood box uh, feast dishes are like the four sides, they kind of have curves. And I like pictured the curves on the bottom of the dress and the design flipped upside down and woven in like this circle. And just like, that would just be, I mean, years and years of work. So it's really impossible in that way. So I really admire Haute Couture. Like so lucky um, that there's like a whole team of skilled people specialized mm -hmm. in all these techniques that can then, there's a designer and somebody can yeah. execute. Um, so we're in a very I, different position. Yeah. I, I like your, your phrase, uh, ancient, ancient couture, because I think, well, on the one hand it evokes, you know, Paris fashion and but but what it really is 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 about is is uh, the the quality the quality of work and the the level of craftsmanship and the um, you know the attention to every detail in the constructing of a garment or um, and you know if we sort of expand that when we look at ancient uh, textiles from around the world I mean we can see that every culture has a way of making things and that the way of making things, there are um, qualities in it. Um, we tend to um, look at, you know, archeological textiles and everything is sort of the same, but it's not true that weavers, you know, some weavers or some, you know, textile making people are more skilled. They have more, they put more care into the way things are made. Although there are some cultural norms, which, which bring that to it, like 
in the Peruvian world, this idea of not cutting the cloth from the loom, but rather weaving in a certain way so that the object is intact and something is made for what it's intended to be. This kind of idea of intent that has a very powerful um, uh, premise for making something. Uh, unlike modern day industrial materials that are woven in you know, 500 yard lengths and cut up into pieces and put you know, around. This idea of one object, one process, one moment, you know, one loom, even if it might be made of several looms, loomed widths, but something that is made to be what it is, um, is a very powerful um, aspect of textile history that in many ways, you know, with the era of fast fashion and everything getting worn and thrown away. And, you know, there's so much that, um, that our generation now is, is losing um, the, the understanding of those values of the value of an object and, and the process and how important that process, you know, what goes into the process. And I think when we look at your work and, and, and as you show your work, uh, you, you can just see that the, that process is so respected and that that, that process, you know, thread by thread creates that um, powerful object and it gives the object power as well as um, um, maybe gives you a sense of uh, creation, you know, you are the creator in a way, uh, engaging in, um, in, a, in a very deep process. Yeah, so many awesome things you touched on. Uh, yeah, I definitely think probably, like you said, because of the industrialization of textiles so early on in our society, like Western society, that um, we've lost touch with that process and how things are made. And, uh, but it seems like most older cultures on the earth like viewed textiles as incredibly sacred and um, the, yeah, I almost feel like on Northwest Coast society, tech, like that, for our culture in particular, the like Nahim weaving was woven by an individual and worn by an individual, but it was seen as belonging to the collective. And it was said to be that it was only taken out in the times when the presence of history was required. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, that like, I, sometimes when I think about carving, I think of it as like, well, you're, I've heard carvers say that like they would see what they wanted to do inside of like the block of wood. But with weaving, it's like much more like if you were to have to make the block of wood first or something, you know, it's much more about building up yeah. um, than taking away, which is really fascinating to me that, um, yeah, that creative process that it's, especially with basketry, like how kind of psychedelic a concept it is to create a form and space. It's like really quite neat of an idea, I think. Um, but yeah. Good. Okay, I think we have a bunch of questions that I think were from the audience. Um, let me see if I can uh, uh, go through it. Okay. Um, uh, Perry Clem asks, um, we often think about transformation in Northwest Coast aesthetics and the form line style. Can you elaborate on how this might resonate with your work and your mention of non-human thought? Hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I would expand on that. Um, I guess the, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really have a very good answer for that question, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. when I hear transformation, I think more of like the transformation of function or, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, okay. Yeah. Well, we, we have plenty sorry. more things to talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, uh, if the person who asked uh, it wants to email me, yeah. I can give a better answer yeah. with some thought. Um, uh, Crystal asks, how many mentors do you work with today? And what advice can you offer about your experience with mentorship? Um, I, I haven't been working with a mentor for a few years. Um, so I worked with uh, Carrie Dick for like 
I guess about a year on and off and on a few months intensively. And then um, I worked with her mom, Sherry Dick for a bunch of months intensively. And then her teacher, William White took me as apprentice for two and a half years or so. And that was pretty intensive that time. And I felt like uh, I haven't, um, whatever the circumstances haven't arose yet for me to take on anybody to mentor. But um, yeah, and in terms of advice around that, I guess um, approaching, you know, from a respectful place and really listening, like I went through a period of um, learning with my teacher, Willie, because like, because I guess um, I have a lot of openness to learning from plants, um, I guess in particular, like I love the material and process a lot. And I, the technique side of things, it, or something that I feel like an incredible gift from the human teachers I've had. And, um, but Willie said one thing to me, <laughs> he said one thing to me a few years in, like after we'd stopped working together, he said, your ears don't work. Um, and he was totally right. Like there's things that he told me and shared with me. Um, he's incredibly like smart person, but like if you have somebody who's mentoring you to really, really listen and respect them because I've had, stages in myself where I've um, not done proper acknowledgement and I've um, not listened, I guess. And, and that's a real learning process uh, yeah. to. But um, sometimes it's also you've, you've listened, but it, it, it takes, you have to get to a certain level to understand its value and importance. You know? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me, let me go for a few more questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, Pat Hickman says, um, can you please talk a little more about your installation of the, the Pleiades installation with your weaving? Yeah, there was, uh, through the work with Andy Everson, um, I guess two things. I had been reading a book um, that was recommended to me. I was researching on the use of um, uh, woman's blood for dying in the red cedar bark ceremonies amongst the Kwakwakiwak. So, and then there was some research from Andy about the Pleiades constellation in Boaz. And it was um, the face paint that we do is um, markings with your two fingers here and it's done with red ochre. Um, and uh, it's actually a stylized representation of the Pleiades constellation. And his family has oral history from Fort Rupert where I think it was his great great grandpa um, would take his daughter or granddaughter out. I can't I don't have the story exactly right, but basically even when he went blind, he would um, take her out winter solstice and get her to guide his finger to the Big Dipper. And I guess I've actually tried this. If you put your finger hands at the same angle, it goes directly to Pleiades. And he said that was where our people originally came from. Mm -hmm. So um, in the animated or in the robe, the bottom face um, has those lines on it probably should have done them in red now that I think of it but um yeah uh we because of the point clouds in that install in the digital part um they kind of look like stars and wanted to start it with that constellation um Don asks can you speak to technique are all the pieces off loom are accessory warps twisted or and or braided and then twined yeah, so the, um, the, the, with the wool weaving, I guess in particular, there's an upright loom that's more of a frame. It's not tensioned on the bottom. It's called gravity weighted. Um, it's hung at one inch increments across and then everything, the techniques in um, shell cut weaving in particular, there's two strand twining. Um, so each stitch is done by hand and manipulated around to warp. Um, and then there is a braiding technique that goes over every single um, warp end. And uh, so that travels horizontally through the warp. And then when it goes vertically, it travels on the surface of the piece. So in person, you can kind of see they have a bit of a raised, the braiding, there's a, a large number of braids and they sit on the surface and they give kind of a bit of a, a low relief carving effect, almost like a panel, I guess. And there's a drawstring technique as well. So when you see, you know, a, a full size uh, chill cat blanket. It can look incredibly complicated, which I guess it is, but that design can be broken up on any vertical point. Uh, point. Um, you can insert a drawstring and kind of 
yeah, hard to describe. <laughs> We have to learn more about that. Um, Scott asked, what, what plant has been the best teacher for you? Um, well, cedar, I guess, and the, yeah, cedar, for mm -hmm. sure, yeah. Um, Ty asked, um, Megan, are the sources of my weaving materials being threatened by climate change? Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot about climate change impacting uh, Western red cedar, uh, about the rain cycles and the growth cycles. Um, so that is a concern. And also on Vancouver Island right now, it's uh, a huge concern that there's a huge amount of logging happening right now and a number of people protesting. So you can check out on Instagram, there's Ferry Creek Blockade. Um, I think that's what they're called. And that's like an ongoing one where they're logging really tremendous old growth and um, um someone asked um can you speak about contemporary reclamation of lost and such ancestral practices um and mentions that we need the flexibility to reinvent ceremonies and traditions that stay alive yeah um it's a big one i think it for me it ties in really strongly with um, the preservation of land and relationship to land because, because of the um, experiences working with the materials because um, technique can have spirit and form can have spirit as well like the, or the function can have spirit but the materials themselves I think are like land is the origin of our art and culture and language you know um, and the ability to return to land um, in the right frame of mind, because the Western education system has really um, embedded like this whole like thing on top of us about what it means to be a person, you know, the English language has, it's like, I've heard it described as language is a pathway, it will lead you down a certain way of viewing the world. So um, deconstructing all those narratives and getting back to like, who we were. I think that can be really difficult if you if you don't have like um, uh, like a strong living culture or a thread that's carried through older teachings and apprenticeship styles. But I don't think it's impossible because even in our um, if you think of your own body and your own the blood in your body that that blood that is inside of us is handed to us in this like totally seamless line from like our very first ancestor which is like quite crazy. And it's, I think that's a, a powerful concept to, to get into. Yeah. yeah. Um, Daniela says that your work is so beautiful, uh, spectacular. What, what fibers are you using for the weavings and what fibers would have been used traditionally before colonization? Um, I'm using uh, cedar bark, so western red cedar and then yellow cedar. I do a lot of the miniatures in yellow cedar, and those are the same fibers. There's some, uh, they're called CMTs or culturally modified trees, and uh, there's bark harvest harvests around Alert Bay on Hanson Island that have been carbon dated. Um, and I think there's some from like 1100 AD, so it's quite old, and the mountain goat uh, wool is the original fiber. And I just did that a uh, small, uh, about a year working with that. Um, and then I use, uh, I was taught to use merino wool and cashmere is what I use now. Cause I think cashmere is probably the closest cause it's a mountain goat, not a mountain sheep. Um, yeah. I, I just have to say that Megan, I had the privilege of having Megan speak with my class this morning on fibers and she showed us her beautiful, um, mountain goat spinning process that is just astonishing. Do you think you could just say a little bit about that process that you use? Yeah, um, so that's one of the examples of books being useful, I guess, uh, because the spinning, I mean, we do our spinning our warp still that's carried through. But with the introduction of commercial yarn, um, we a lot of the times are using like an S twist uh, merino wool or something for our weft. Um, but I, I applied for a grant. Um, I think it's funny now that I, I applied for a grant to learn to spin mountain goat wool. Um, 
before I even had started weaving Chilkat. And I, my pre I proposed to weave a full size robe, um, which was ended up being impossible to spin that much when you're relearning techniques. But I used um, Emmons book, The Chilkat Blanket, it's like uh, from 1907, I think. So I, I bought a, a copy of that um, online and worked from that. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess uh, so you, you, you really cross worlds here, which is, I think it's wonderful that you find a book online from the early 20th century that that helps you learn a process that that's part of the long history of knowledge and, and understanding. And you seem to really master it. So it must have been very well uh, <laughs> presented. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, someone is asking about um, natural pigments and if you have any favorites that um, or do you experiment with 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 pigments and dyes, I would say natural dyes. I've only done dyeing a couple of times. Uh, the last time I did was a few probably five years ago in Prince Rupert with a group of weavers and we one color that's um, more commonly used as dyeing is the original dye for the yellow, which is uh, wolf moss. It's kind of like a lichen mm -hmm. and it's like super fluorescent yellow on the trees. I think it grows on pine trees, um, kind of in the interior of BC and it goes down all the way through the US to some point. I don't know how far, but that one's um, really, really beautiful mm -hmm. um, and the original one. And then there was hemlock bark and like all sorts of fasting, like um, and like in iron rich soil and copper that hasn't been treated. So like a, Combination and that's in Emmons as well, but it's not very clear on how long. So I think there's some people in um, Alaska doing some dyeing with hemlock bark now, though, that they had good results. But um, would the blue and, have been indigo originally, or uh, you know? no? I think there's two two theories. Um, there's I think a river in Simshan territory and the Nadine River on Haida Gwaii both have this like blue gray stone um, that they know was ground up and used as pigment for paint. Uh -huh. um, but nobody's tried it for the the blue in Chilkat. And then there is another color in Chilkat that kind of forest green um, yeah. as well, but. And then the other theory for the blue, the robin's egg blue is, um, I think they know this actually where uh, the woman, so it was post-contact, they would uh, boil the blue trade cloth to extract the color and then um, dye wool with that. Mm -hmm. And then there is some sparing use of red in Chilkat, but they say that that was um, uh, Raveled. That through the trade blankets, they right. would just mm -hmm. take the, the thread yeah. out. <laughs> People do that all over the world. Um, that, that special red trade cloth, um, sometimes it's dyed with matter, sometimes it's cochineal, sometimes it's lac. Um, we find it all over the world and many cultures um, undo the threads. The Navajo are famous for doing that and, and reweaving with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes they even tease it out and re-spin it so that it's the kind of quality of yarn that, that they want. Wow. Other times it's just scraps of the red cloth that you see, you know, you know as, as little extra, you know, sparking colors. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Okay. I'd like to learn more about dyeing though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there's one last question. Um, Bianca, you, is that? I don't see. I don't see it. But I have one more. Um, I think we. Oh, um, so John asks, could you please speak more about the gut, which you mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> the gut. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess. Yeah, the I guess what they mean about the the like intellect and headiness and then here. Um, yeah, I, I think the time that I was working with, it happened once with the cedar bark, um, where it was a really palpable, like distinct sensation of just like exiting my mind and being a part of what it might be like to be in the natural world and growing. Mm -hmm. um, and this different form or measure of time of how plants grow. Um, particularly cedar trees, um, which was really like a 
deep sense of peace um, in my own body. But I did learn um, years later, I was working with a woman who uh, practiced a form of um, like a Taoist type of yoga, I think she called it heart drum beat. And um, it was all about, she described like human energetics as like, usually we're very like hot headed and cold and disconnected from our core and our breath is very shallow. So her thing was you wanna have water up and fire down. So you wanna have a warm core and deep breathing into your core and then um, cool headed so you're not hot tempered and all these things. So that um, the breathing techniques um, with that um, also achieved that um, for me. And um, I don't practice it quite as much. Well, I don't as much as I used to, but it was a really powerful practice that, um, yeah, I would recommend. So. Okay. Well, that's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much. That was such an interesting hour, Megan. Your work is so exquisite. Um, I'm going to send you the Q&A portal report afterward. There's so many lovely compliments in there. But I did want to read out one before we close up. Someone named Fran is in our audience. She says that she knows your gran and was present at Gutsi for the naming ceremony. Cool. And she really likes the new designs you're making with chill cat weaving. <laughs> cool. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, we've got Thanks. lots of fans in the audience. Thank you so much for your time today, the both of you. This was such a great mm -hmm. program. And uh, we did have some people asking about this recording and when that will be available. Um, it's gonna be available immediately on facebook.com slash Fowler Museum. It'll be posted on our website and on our Instagram in the coming days for you to revisit and share. And we hope that you guys will join us again next time for our next program. You can find more information on the closing slide. In the meantime, I hope everyone has a great day. Great. Thanks, Bianca. Thanks so much. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.